I find it hard to believe what has happened in terms of American policy. I can't imagine anything more counter to American interests than what we have done in the last two years in the context of the Ukraine. And first of all, nobody in the high policy echelons of government would look at the Ukraine and decide to resume the Cold War without understanding the other other matters that are at stake. The Ukraine is very important. We'll talk about it individually. But, but the Syrian war, 400,000 people dead, nations destroyed, in large measure due to a decision by the United States to invade the Middle East, and a war that cannot be resolved, certainly without a close work and attention with Russia. The United Nations. United Nations can't work without the United States and the Soviet and Russia working together as permanent members of the Security Council. And there's so many questions where working together would make such a difference. I think of what happened two summers ago when we were talking about the line in the sand and everybody got excited that Obama wouldn't have the guts to keep his promise that if that line in the sand was crossed, we were really going to respond. Well, it was the way I recall it that the Prime Minister of Britain went to the Parliament to ask for forces to help join the United States in response to the line in the sand, and the Parliament told them, no, we don't participate. And the President of the United States sounded out to Congress there weren't 10 percent of the members of the Congress who wanted to go to war. So the idea came forth, and it wasn't just from Russia because there were American groups working on it too. Let's work together and get Syria to sign the, mass, the, the, the treaty on mass, uh, weapons of mass destruction. There were only five countries that hadn't signed it. Syria was one. And that's what we did. But the Russians worked with us together to bring that accomplishment about. Not only did we get the agreement, we got Syria to destroy the inventory of weaponry that it had been involved in. And the other thing is the nuclear, nuclear armory. Are we crazy? There's two countries in the world that are essentially equal with nuclear weapons. The Soviet Russia is one of them. We have to work together, as my colleagues have said, to save the world from that rogue nation or even that rogue radical uh, person who is going to be able to get to nuclear weapons in the next decade and perhaps use it. We must enforce the non-proliferation treaty. We must work together to see to it that rogue nations do not get nuclear weapons. The destruction that's, important, that's related to that is so colossal, so difficult to think about. Well, those four considerations, the Ukraine, Syria, the United Nations, nuclear weapons, you put those together and it's absolutely compelling that the United States and the Russia work together as, as nations. That, I don't care if we're friends. I mean, if the president can't stand Putin's face, that's up to him. But his larger obligation as president of the United States is to get along in the context of these issues. Nobody's entitled to use their personal reaction to another international leader to the detriment of America as we are now, in my judgment, facing. Someone said to me the other day, you know, there's, there's no real sovereign wars extant in the world today. All the wars are civil wars. That's probably true, and they're much more difficult to deal with in many ways. And the one thing America, at the very height of its power in the world today, capable of resisting any kind of aggression against it and defeating it. The United States, in my judgment, and I thought it was the President's objective, is to use its great power not to allow war to begin, but instead of that, to use its great power to bring these civil situations together where new social contracts can be discussed and written. Wars can't be won anymore. We've seen that in every conflict since the Second World War. Vietnam, Iraq, these wars can't be won. And understanding that, why would the United States want to resume a hostile, negative attitude that would, in fact, pour liquid oil on the fires of civil wars everywhere in the country? I always say when I'm speaking about Russia, I always like to give two numbers. 
Russia, the Soviet Union, and the Second World War lost 27 million lives. The United States lost 406,000. We take that we were the ones who made the war and the victory possible. But everybody has seemed to forget Stalingrad and the extraordinary sacrifice of Russian lives and families. There's not a family in Russia today that isn't still deeply scarred by the cost of the war. And why would we want to turn on a country that had suffered as it had suffered, that had gone through perhaps the most decisive civil convulsion when the Soviet Union broke up into its various independent states and then lost its patrimony to oligarchs whom we encouraged in the name of free enterprise? I mean, what Russia has gone through in the last 70 years perhaps is worth our at least thinking if we've lost our ability to, uh, to, to sympathize with that cost and that terrible destruction. Let's at least realize its reality. I think the, um, the United States has a clear obligation. Ukraine is entitled to its freedom and to its free decisions as to how it's going to be involved. And it should, if it chooses, become part of the European Union, an event, by the way, that I think is long a ways away under the best of circumstances just giving the cost of what it is to keep the Ukraine alive. Yes, that is an objective that we sustain we object, and, and we encourage. But there was a time, and Ambassador Matlock remembers it certainly, I've heard Mr. Gorbachev say it, where the United States, and in order to convince Russia and President Gorbachev to accept the possibility of the unification of Germany and to allow that unified Germany into NATO, the United States agreed that it would not allow NATO to be on the borders of Russia. A promise broken before, almost before it was made. And we have seen now the escalation of problems and forces as NATO seeking to find a mission that justifies its existence has become the centerpiece of this problem in the Ukraine. Whatever happened in the Ukraine two years ago, there were forced, everybody made terrible mistakes. We certainly, the Russians certainly, the European Union certainly, the Ukrainians certainly. Our job now is to try to put that back together. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because the Ukraine is a very divided country, always on the edge of civil war. And our task is not to side with one group and certainly not the extremes of that group to the derogation of the possibilities of the future of the Ukraine. And I think we have to reconsider very deeply what is the mission of NATO. We are in the province this past week. We've announced billions of dollars of armaments that are going to be distributed to the NATO countries. Against what threat? Well, of course, they're defining the threat in only one terms. But I'm grateful to my friend, Alfred Ross, for giving me an article today saying that Russia will bring peace to Syria, and the person who is saying this is a German general who is a former chairman of the NATO military committee. In other words, this is a decision that has to be rethought. We have to use Finland as the ideal marker that we want. Finland, which is as entitled to as much anger and distrust and fear of Russia as any other country, more than any other country. Finland is a member of the European Union, but it is not a member of NATO. And I have no doubt that the centerpiece of the forces in NATO, besides the involvement of the clandestine forces of the United States that caused the overthrow of a duly elected government, which seems to me nobody's concerned anymore, that we should in fact reconsider what our position is with NATO and give Russia what it's entitled to in terms of the assurances that it is not an aggressive force. Because there are many things that are happening today where that could be the case. We are Americans in the midst of a presidential election where we've lost all capacity to speak reasonably 
but we are still, our power and our force and our ideals are at stake here. And it seems to me that our greatest obligation, both to ourselves and to the world that we want to create and lead, is to find a way to work with Russia, not to resume the Cold War, which would be the mortgage on the president's legacy that he will forever regret, in my judgment, but to understand that our present obligation is to bring this discussion back to reality and rationality and end this process. Thank you.